Yeah, no. And we learn facts yeah, from the demography. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me here. Thanks to Matteo and thanks to Maria for uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's very nice. I'm very surprised by the diversity. I mean, not surprised, but the uh, diversity of topics that we are taking, like just the last two talks, like and, and mine as well, uh, extremely, extremely different. But I guess it will be the role of this workshop that we talk to one another. So um, it's, it, it's very nice. So I was tasked uh, with a First of all, I'm I'm Anne Goujon. I work at the International Institute for Applied System Analysis in uh, in Austria, where uh, I lead the program on population and just societies. And I was tasked with the, with giving you a few relevant aspects and facts about demographic trends. In the program, it states that I'm going to present about the key issues, but in fact, I, I downscaled it to like some key issues because in fact, there, there's more to what I, I, I will present here um, in this one. So I will have like three major parts. I will talk about some of mega trends and I'm not sure I will say anything that you don't know, but at least maybe it's good to, to recap on some of these things. And then I will have like two focus, one on the local context, which I think is important and we've heard it in through several of the talks. And the other one is about human capital and the importance of education, uh, for instance, in influencing some of the, um, of the trends that we see and that are relevant also for many of the talks that we, well, we had. So in terms of uh, mega trends, uh, mostly we have nowadays demographic imbalances um, in terms of um, growing global population, uneven population structures, as changing size and composition of labor forces. And in the global north, especially, we have these increasing implications on uh, society due um, to, uh, to aging. Um, like uh, one week or two weeks ago, the United Nations released their new population uh, projections where um, they are showing what the, the world in uh, until 2100 would look like. So we have a peak around the, uh, no, we don't have a peak, but until 2050, it would be about like 9.7 billion. And by the end of the century, uh, it would reach uh, something like 10.4 billion. And you see that the uncertainty surrounding these uh, projection increases with time, which is, uh, which is uh, approximately, which is normal with um, the interval being like around uh, between 9 billion and 12.5 uh, 12 12 billion approximately um, by the end of the century. What we do, uh, what we think about, and the main theory that is driving um, demography is uh, demographic transition theory, which I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with, uh, which is like in primitive societies, in earlier societies, um, death rates and birth rates were uh, canceling one another so that we had like a very slow population growth or no population growth. And then we've, the industrial revolution with the arrival of um, with education with progress in um, in uh, in health in medicine uh, there was a decrease in death rates which was not in, which is not uh, instantly uh, followed by decrease in birth rate and this creates this natural increase that we see and then the theory goes that uh, like birth rates and death rates will uh, decline um, and the same and that by the end of this demographic transition, I mean, not the end, but what would be the next step would be a natural decrease instead of a natural increase. What is showing, what I'm showing, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. Wait, wait, sorry. Uh, what I'm showing here on the, um, on the, on the right-hand side is the reality. So how it looks like, again, taking uh, these population projections by the United Nations, and we see that the reality is not very far from the theory. So the theory seems to be uh, actually modeling um, the, 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 the theory quite well. 
uh, where uh, at the moment we are in a stage of high population growth, and, but with uh, envisioning um, the natural decrease by, by the end of the century. Um, of course, there are different stages of the demographic transitions. So what you have here on this side is for more developed regions where um, we are now about uh, here in 2020, where uh, then you have this period of natural increase is over and we are going to start the period of natural, natural decrease. And the, the thing that you see here is the blip of um, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID experience in, 2000, uh, in 2020. And then that would lead to a population decline and population decline that started in many of our societies. In less developed region, um, what is here shown on the, on the right hand side, we are a different stage and uh, birth rates are declining, death rates are declining. You again see the, the little blip of the, of the COVID-19, but a natural decrease is not yet there. It's apparently according to the central scenario of the United Nation, it's coming soon by the end, uh, by the end of the century. Marianne, uh, so why is uh, death rate increasing? Sorry again? Is death rate increasing? I mean, are this say, oh, the climate rate. change or? No, the death rate is increasing uh, as a result of, um, 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 so like there is uh, more, more people who are getting to the age. So like increase in life expectancy is leading to having more people of uh, age where they would die and then okay. therefore the death rate would be increasing. So at different geographic scales, then you have, uh, of course, different uh, trends in the in the population. So what we see here, for instance, uh, on this uh, graph, is uh, the population, the, the increase in population between 2022, so nowadays, to 2050, and we see that the world would increase by 1.8, approximately billion people, and uh, most of the increase will happen in sub-Saharan Africa, one billion. A uh, little bit in North Africa and Western Asia, and uh, again uh, a, a little bit in uh, North, in um, Central and Southern Asia. The rest of the uh, of the regions that are represented here uh, would have more or less no increase or very little increase, and some of them are already uh, declining. Like uh, we can see in of um, of uh, East and South Southeast Asia between 2022 to 2100 the increase of the world population will be by 2.4 billion and major increase will be in sub-Saharan Africa where we would have like 2.3 uh, billion uh, increase. A few of these, these, these other regions, uh, North Africa, Western Asia, uh, Central and Southern Asia, but you see that the, in all of the region there would be either decline or, uh, or like stable. Um, so one of the interesting questions that I find uh, is that um, if fertility decline continues everywhere uh, and all countries eventually achieve fertility levels below replacement level, the world population will start shrink shrinking. And if this continue into a distant future, future uh, would it lead to the extinction of human species, which we don't really envisage because no species is looking for extinction as such. But uh, could we imagine it? Or can we envisage that countries or region would strive, would start striving to achieve an optimum population level? And what could that be? And this is a question that we, as demographers, don't not not really uh, tackle very much. I mean, we we tend to to stay uh, in this area, but it's it's very it would be very interesting to think of the world that will come in a, into the future. In terms of megatrends. These changes, of course, create uneven population structures. And here I have an example of three countries, uh, Italy, uh, France, and uh, Niger, where you can see that uh, in Italy, about uh, almost 50% of the population is above the age of 50 in 2022, um, and like the very narrow and narrowing uh, base. Whereas in France, uh, we have also like 40 more, uh, around 40% above the age of 50, but like the base is, uh, is uh, it's much bigger because France has, has had a higher fertility in the last, um, in the last few decades. 
And then for Niger, we have this very thin um, pyramid, H pyramid with quite a large base. And why it is thin? Because it, I took this directly from the website of the United Nations. And what they uh, they scale the pyramids to uh, the what would be the population in 2100, and for Niger there is a huge growth uh, that is going to happen. Niger is actually the country where, I mean, as far as we know, uh, the dem demographic transition has not started yet. So they still have like uh, for decades now. In the past decades, uh, women have been having like seven children uh, in, uh, in in general. So this is like with huge uncertainty as how this will change uh, into the future. This has implication in terms of the composition of labor forces. Uh, so like we know in the EU, so in the global north, there would be uh, the number of working age population will decrease uh, by, uh, so for instance, in the EU, it would be by like 47 million by between 2022 and 2100. And this is the same in many other societies, in Russia, in Japan, in China, of course, the numbers are much bigger with like some 285 million uh, decline by the end of the century. Um, different um, in the United States, uh, the population active uh, would uh, expect it to increase. Um, mostly because of migration expectations and also of uh, of fertility, which is uh, remaining quite high. On the other opposite, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the work, working age population is projected to double, to more than double uh, between uh, uh, 2022 and 2050, and to increase by uh, around uh, to 1 billion by the end of the century. So there are huge implications about that especially if we consider what is the situation in Sub-Saharan Africa now, that there will be a need, first of all, to educate this population and to find uh, employment for, for them. In terms of labor force participation rates, uh, we know that since the 1990s, the labor force participation has been uh, declining globally, which is uh, the which is due to rising educational uh, school enrollment rates, uh, increasing opportunities to retire with uh, a, a like pension system being uh, being implemented in many countries where they were didn't exist before, and also um, higher life expectancy. What you see on this graph is actually the difference, uh, especially so you see first of all that like labor force participation rates are very different across the world. So uh, it goes like something from forty percent in some countries to almost one hundred percent to ninety percent. But you also see that uh, in all world, uh, in all countries, the female, the, women, the participation rate of women is much lower than that of men. So this is also something uh, levers that uh, we that can be activated in order to uh, increase whatever you want. You have a question? Yes. Uh, is there any pattern, any commonality? in the countries where uh, the female participation is very low? Uh, I mean, most of them are in the global south. That's, that's one thing. Uh, it has to do uh, with the autonomy of women, the, the choice. It's also, I must say, not a very good indicator because in many countries, what you count as labor force. So women, it's not like women are at home doing nothing. Mostly they are in the fields, they are cultivating and so on, or they are going to the market uh, selling uh, the product. So it's a, it's a, it's a improper uh, uh, indicator that doesn't reflect exactly, but it's like mostly global, uh, yeah, I would say global south. And there are uh, increasing implications on society due uh, to aging, um, uh, like uh, the aging uh, puts pressure on the public expenditure, puts pressure on healthcare system. And one of um, our world in data, a uh, great picture is that where you see like with increase in, um, in life expectancy, you have a huge increase in, in health expenditure, which you can uh, expect to happen uh, more and more with um, with, uh, with more uh, aging. And uh, it has also implications on voting results. And I will talk about this a bit more uh, uh, later because like with aging, usually people become more conservative and, uh, uh, and th therefore 
uh, when times comes when change is needed, uh, where you would expect to pass on law about uh, climate change, about environmental change, then uh, this may have an implications on what decisions are being made, and also uh, about uh, old age uh, poverty. So we see, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because I know that my colleague uh, Sergei Sherbov will talk about this and he's going to be very mad when I talk about uh, dependency ratio. But like we can see that the, there is a change of, of the ratio of workers to pensioners. Like for instance, in Japan in 1990, there was 5.8 workers for one uh, elderly person. Uh, whereas in 2025, so now basically there are uh, 2.1 workers for one elderly person. And in that graph, I didn't do that uh, that infographics, but they highlighted the 0 0.1 is the are the feet of a of a person, and uh, in the case of Japan, I mean, I would think it's the more the head that is uh, that is in that case uh, very important. So now let me move um, to to like two parts, the two parts that I highlighted. One is a local context because I mean, like to frame it in the in the the, the theme of the conference is that like adaptation, uh, it's highly context specific, uh, very hard to quantify. So we need actually this territorial analysis that tell a lot about what is needed in a village, in a town or, or, or in a region. And um, as well, what we see about this aging, the effect of a demographic transition needs to be tackled mostly at the, at the local level. So this aging we know has impacts on uh, accessibility to services and amenities, GDP per capita, attitudes and political behavior. And I'm going to offer this. So we have, if we look at the municipality level across uh, the EU, so now I'm, I'm, I'm moving to the, I'm, I'm scoping on the, on the European Union, we can see that uh, there are very diverse uh, changes in population that are expected. So this is between 2020, 2015 and 2030. And uh, you see from the, the color and from the growth of the population about 65 years of age that is changing very uh, quite, quite a lot. And it's also um, changing depending on the place of, uh, of residence. So uh, if you notice between like capital cities, uh, like uh, Madrid and, and so on. So there are different, different patterns that are here uh, in place. What we show uh, with the research, and this is research actually that I did at the Joint Research Center um, uh, previously, where I was in, uh, in, in, in ISPRA, that aging is uh, more linked at the territorial level, is more linked to the population than at the place of residence. So it's not only a rural phenomenon. So you have also urban areas that are, uh, deep being, that are depopulating. And this is a, an important aspect. So it's more the attractiveness of a place that determines whether a place is, is, uh, is uh, depopulating or attracting more people. There are also other phenomenon which is due to the life course of individuals. So people, where do people live uh, depends at what age they are and at what stage they are in their in their in their lives. So whether they are a young couple, whether they are students, or whether they, whether they have already children, at what age, and whether they were elderly. And if you look at this graph, um, which is showing uh, the population density and two two age group, elderly 65 plus and children 0 14 plus. You can see that the, it, it changes uh, quite importantly with less elderly at a higher density of population. And uh, also the spatial sorting is uh, uh, manifest itself with age segregation. And this is particularly the case in the young and, uh, and the elderly. I'm not going to go into this, this graph. What we also looked at is, and that it's also something that you hear often, that uh, like what is the role of migration? Uh, in that case, this is net migration in balancing this, um, this uh, working age population that is diminishing. And depending on the definition of, uh, of what is working age population, then this we can, we can go into. But what we see is like, and this is shown here on this graph, um, showing the net migration and the cohort turnover, so meaning how 
uh, cohorts are being able to replace uh, one another. So young cohorts entering the labor force and old cohorts exiting the labor force. And, and we can see, first of all, that the working age population is not decreasing in all region. So this is like the colors, so red for decreasing, blue for increasing. Actually, most uh, regions benefit from positive net migration, and this is especially the case in urban areas. But, however, like in only 28% of these regions, net migration is enough to counterbalance the negative impact of uh, cohort turnover. Also, this net migration is very different inside uh, across regions within a country. And we have a case of Italy, which I guess is well known, where if we look at the net migration of uh, the different region of Italy, you can see that in the south, there's negative net migration, whereas there's positive uh, net migration in, uh, in the north. So like it seems to be um, um, migration movement from the south to the north. In Germany, uh, we have different cases. It's more like from the east to the west and to the, to, to the south, but with more patchwork of, um, of, uh, of patterns. Um, what are the impacts? The impacts are important of this age distribution are very important in terms of in terms of uh, macro and outputs. Um, what we see is that uh, with a high share of middle aged population, we have uh, regional economic uh, performance peaks. So this is shown by uh, GDP per capita. There is a nonlinear effect of age structure. Um, in uh, depopulating rural and uh, with neg negative net migration regions. And also in these regions, actually having a high share of young population doesn't help. So it doesn't bring up. So it's not only also the age that is important, which brings to the fact that it seems to be, to indicate that economic performance rather drives demography rather than, than the opposite, that demography would drive uh, demographic performance. So it's a bit sad for us demographers that uh, doesn't work this way. It has issues with accessibility to services and urban amenities, of course, where people are distributed, and I'm not going to go into that. And it has also importance, what I was saying about political attitudes and behavior, uh, where age and territory matters, and um, there is uh, an interaction actually between age and place of residence. And you can see it here, which is the proportion of respondents uh, with trust into the European Union, so intro into the European Union institution. And you can see that um, at uh, younger ages, um, there is a large gap. So people tend to, like young people living in large towns, tend to have more trust in the EU institution compared to those living in rural areas. Um, this is this gap is still present at uh, the middle age, let's say, or for um, or for uh, this the, the trust becomes lower for both groups, and then at higher ages, uh, then you seem to have a concordance of of opinions and lower opinions trust to, towards the EU. So this was the part that I had on the local context, which I think is important. And I think we could have done this on, on, many, on many different settings. Now we'd like to, to finish uh, my presentation with like focusing on a human capital. And here I mean, I mean, I know that uh, I rather mean on education as human capital. So I'm going to forget a bit the health component that, uh, of, of human capital, which is also important. So human capital, demo education has an impact of demography. Uh, it decreases fertility, supports healthy lifestyle and reduces mortality. It has also an important uh, impact on the adaptive capacity of societies. And uh, of course, an impact on the behavior of individual and societies. And this is something uh, that we have shown that education has a role beyond uh, demography. And here, uh, it, it has also to do with what we were discussing about these limits to growth that were put forward and were, in fact, uh, also or the Ehrlich population bomb uh, thing. And I think what was missing uh, was taking into consideration the ability of the population of people to change and to adapt uh, to, the, to, to, to the society they live in. And I think it's also something that we don't always uh, consider 
very much in when we when we look into the future. So I, I think and one area where um, we can change is that uh, with education, educating people. So with enhancing of cognitive skill, uh, we change the risky behavior. Uh, it extends personal planning horizon so that you think more about the future. You learn also from past damages. So if you've been aware of the damage, and this has been shown in the case of different um, uh, disasters, uh, you learn and then you adapt for, uh, for, for, for the possibility of the next damage. You have better access to relevant information, improvement of health, physical well-being, and higher income level, which I already said. So all these things are extremely important for uh, tackling uh, uh, the, the, the challenges that we face today in terms of uh, global climate change and so on. And as it happens, um, the 20th century was actually the, the century of an education revolution. So if we look here, for instance, an enrollment in primary education taking from the uh, earlier 19th century, to uh, 2010, we see that there has been these huge increases uh, in uh, in education uh, everywhere uh, in the in in the world, and we really moved since 1950 from a low educated to a middle educated world. So that uh, basically in 1950, about three quarters of the population had a primary education or less, and like 50 percent had less than the prime, no education at all. Whereas in 2020, we have a bit of reverse uh, where about more than three quarters of the population have a primary education and more, and uh, more than uh, almost half of, of this population have a lower secondary or, or have a upper secondary or more. So like huge changes into the education level of, uh, of the population. So it's... Of course, this is increasing, but we see also that this is increasing very slowly. And that is a bit the problem of the education is that you educate mostly in school. And you uh, once you have acquired a level, then you carry it through all your, your life until, until you die. So it's something that is very slow to change. And if we look at the minions of schooling of a population 15 plus in some of these regions, you can see that it's moving very slowly. The path of this selected region doesn't cross. And what we also see is that with a few exceptions, like Latin America and the Caribbean, women still have a lower secondary, a lower minions of schooling than uh, compared, to, uh, compared to men. As mentioned, why is it important for demography? It's important because there's a huge link between education and fertility. Uh, we can see here the total fertility rate by education, and it's comparing two large groups uh, with no education or primary education and uh, secondary or higher education. And you can see that, and this, yeah, and you can see that these differences are quite large. For instance, in Niger, which is the first country, these two groups have uh, a difference of uh, three children. And if you would take other education categories like no education and uh, secondary education, then the, the gaps would be uh, even, uh, even, even higher. Of course, uh, the, with fertility decline, the education differentials become uh, smaller, uh, what you can see here with the total fertility rate on the x-axis and the difference in TFR between the women with secondary education and those with a primary education. So after uh, a certain education level uh, and the once the countries have attained a, a different fertility rate, then uh, the importance of education for influencing the fertility rate uh, is not so important. But this um, having education is, could, be, could make the difference in the future of the world in terms of total population. And this is uh, what uh, we show at IASA where we developed these um, education population projection scenarios that include education in the projections and where we go from 1950 to 2100 and we follow we have these three uh, scenarios uh, which are the population model for uh, actually entering the IPCC so it's a shared socioeconomic pathways and the shared socioeconomic pathway one is that of sustainability. This is the SSP2 is the middle of the road and the SSP3 is uh, one of fragmented world, I think the scenario is called. 
And you can see that with different education levels, that would entail different fertility levels, that would entail also different uh, mortality level, then you would have different population. And uh, I guess uh, what we see in this room would be more valuable, would be um, a shared socioeconomic pathways one, so a sustainability world where the population would peak in the middle of a second uh, uh, half of a century and then would go start declining quite rapidly to uh, reach uh, eight point some, uh, yeah, less than 8 billion by 2100. Whereas if we go to the other extreme of uh, SSP3, uh, we have uh, like population increasing very fast uh, to uh, reach uh, almost 40 billion. So like different education uh, could have an influence on the future population. Um, I'm, yeah, and so like, the, another area where we are discussing, and maybe it's not it's something that is less important for you here, especially like uh, ecologists and so on. So it, this idea that we may, as society moves to lower fertility levels, it's something that is very difficult to change. So once you enter a low fertility, ultra low fertility, like we're having some East Asian society where fertility is actually below one child per woman, then it's very difficult to, to, uh, to, to go up again. And maybe it's not wanted to have fertility going increasing again. Uh, we don't know, but uh, so this is something where uh, demographers and uh, governments are talking a lot. So when you go, so we have uh, people uh, like many uh, scientists or uh, like uh, no, uh, South Korean going to France to see how do they manage to have a, a, so high fertility, like what are the policies that are behind? Because once, and, and like not being very effective in rising uh, fertility levels, because there is exactly um, this um, fertility trap and we can talk about what makes it a, a, a trap. So when you adapt uh, to new uh, societal uh, patterns of fertility. And actually, if you look at the at the right hand side graph, you see that uh, actually uh, the UN, for instance, is forecasting um, more and more countries to be below replacement levels, which is what is bringing to this uh, low fertility, uh, to this uh, to this natural decrease um, that that I show at the very beginning. And I think this is the last slide that I have. And I don't have a conclusion really. So um, I think uh, um, I think what we talked about, uh, like this uh, ideological change that came also a, lo a lot, so is very important. And I think that that's where education can be uh, an important element. And like what I was showing is only about the quantity of education, so how much people get quantity, but I think the, the curriculum of this education that we that we give the children is something that we need needs to be to be improved. So we tend to reproduce and have the same education uh, component in uh, over and over into the into the future, and this needs to be uh, to be changed. And that's where uh, the ide uh, ideological change can can bring. And I think I will stop here because I really need a drink. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, part. Thank you very much. This was very nice, lovely exposition. I've sort of, once we sort of open up, given the fact that we are at ICTP and it's a, and just like the, your own institution, it's multidisciplinary. I was wondering how to bring some ecology into demography. That's is really rather important. In your first half, when you were talking about the global picture, let me put it this way to you. Suppose, suppose you were a scholar in 1939, maybe during the war years, and you were asked, what's the next 70 years likely to be, you know, until, say, 2020? Uh, my guess is that the prediction would have been completely wildly off from what we have experienced. It's been a phenomenal period, 70, 1950 onwards to today but not in terms of demography no, on, no, I'm, no I'm talking in sorry I'm not speaking to demography I'm talking about the life in general yeah okay yeah. so likewise the next 70 years we might be it might be a good idea to think about 
alternative scenarios in the following sense, uh, bringing in ecology, which is what we were discussing earlier in the morning. So in these projections, there's a presumption that in some sense we can extrapolate from this last 70 years into the next 70 years. And I think that's very dangerous. It's dangerous because of all the reasons that in you know, the previous lecture and the other lectures were, which is that we, we are really facing a serious ecological crisis here. So that's in some sense that might want that, perhaps we ought to allow that to influence our thoughts about what lies ahead and therefore what we should do. And I want to connect it up at this final point, which is again, regarding education. I, I've always felt that it's not surprising that educational institutions and research institutions and international organizations would uh, put their money on education because that's they are our business. As a professor, of course, that's the one thing I would like to say, yes, go for it. But I wonder how important that is for demography. In the following sense, the demographic transitions have taken place in the past. This is not the first time. They you know, came down from about eight down to about four uh, in, in Northern Europe. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, France and Germany. And that had very little to do with education. People are pretty literate. Uh, it had to do with uh, uh, land, uh, own, you know, uh, inheritance laws. Uh, leading to changes in marriage patterns, age of birth, getting married, and therefore things followed. So ecology has not been brought in. And I wonder whether we shouldn't, I mean, this is more like a reflection. And this, I'm not really commenting, your, your talk was excellent. Uh, it's the reflection that demography without ecology and, and society in some sense, analysis of society as opposed to describing it, uh, I think there is, we lose something big on it. So I wouldn't put my money on education in the way you're doing, not because I don't think you, what you said is not right. Of course, you, what you said is fine, exactly right. It's but that any monocausal explanation really worries me in the social sciences. I wouldn't put my money on education that much. Education is extremely costly, terrifically costly because uh, you know, data on um, literacy rates are extremely questionable. Uh, from the believe me, I have spoken a lot to people at the bank, for example, in the World Bank. Um, it's more of the motivations. People can be very intelligent, know what's in their interest without being able to write. They can they can all count, by the way. Numeracy is universal pretty much everywhere because otherwise you can't do exchange. But literacy has, to me, has played a far significant in my understanding of human history, at least from the, you know, in the modern, postmodern world, I mean, not, uh, sorry, early modern world onwards, 1500 onwards, suggests to me that I think we may overestimate the importance of education. There are many other factors going on. I don't know if this makes sense, but yes, I no, thought no, in ICT, we ought does. to. Oh, no, uh, thanks. Ecology as well. Yeah, so I, I think, and I like I really simplified what I, what I said, but these these shared socioeconomic pathways that are being revised at the moment, and a lot there was a I don't know if you heard, but there was a scenario forum at Yasa one month ago more or less, and and a, a lot of the talk was about like building this feedback effect, so that also like we are not only like population there. And that has been the problem. So it's both like the fault of the demographers and the fault of the people using the the the, the, the population projections. So like not talking to one another and not, but like we need to be to build these feedbacks of it, this loop uh, into the so that that like one affect one another. And I think this is uh, and yeah, I, I I agree with you. It's it's totally key. I also agree with a. Uh, I mean I not fully agree with what you said about education yeah it's costly um and and least i mean uh, what we see as well is that at the moment a lot of uh, funding is going into education but not quality education and this is another sdg that that is very important is is that to have quality education and we see it sometimes like the increase in levels of education has been done at the expense of quality education. So like functional 
uh, literacy or uh, like literacy, which is not only reading a simple sentence and so on, but like being able to function in, a, in society is not increasing as much as enrollment is increasing in many, in many societies. And we have a, an article that came out uh, this year, last year in, in PNAS that is showing that like how this has, this, this has changed. So there's also a lot of things uh, about uh, this. And about what you said about the demographic transition, yeah, of course, like, it was modernization. So it included education as well. I think what, what we show in the demographic transition, it also included that, but not only that, that I, I agree with you. And I'm sure I probably uh, forgot some of the points you made, but uh, we can discuss later, yeah. I was just saying I love demography, so thank you for, for your talk. <laughs> um, so could you help us make sense on this note, but with, with a bit more focus, can you help us make sense of what just happened through COVID? Uh, a lot of people were, uh, particularly with, with birth rates. Um, so there was a certain expectation, which we may or may not believe that there would be a, a baby boom, but that was in most cases a baby bust. But I wonder if you could help us also see where the countries that dealt with the crisis with less uncertainty and so on, led to different effects or not and be interesting it seems like it created some paradoxes at least relative to what some people expected so at the moment we don't i mean we see rather it's i mean what we saw is rather a baby bust than a baby boom so yeah like having people stuck together a couple stuck together apparently they didn't think about making babies i don't know why but uh yeah and uh, we also show, because it's sometimes like crises have different effect depending on the region. So like, uh, like an, economic, well, an economic crisis in the, in the global north usually is like a baby bust, whereas sometimes you have a contrary effect in the, in the global south. And the few evidence that we have, uh, for instance, in Africa, we, we, it's not like we have a lot of evidence, but like uh, four African countries that we looked at, apparently there was no impact on fertility increasing or decreasing so it was just like uh, like 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 a bit uh, the same and uh and relatively and what we see is like it's a relatively short uh um short term impact so it, it's like it's a blip uh it's not something that is going as far as we can see maybe maybe it's I'm wrong maybe i'm wrong but also in terms of life expectancy and i think maybe sergey will talk about this also um showing like how it has not uh i mean it's not going in the future affect uh the curve because it's just a, a temporal event so yeah i i think it's not like it's not going to change um fertility or mortality for the future i mean i hope i'm right <laughs> okay thank you uh so i think uh, there are no other questions so we have um uh more time to discuss and uh so i think we close here the session and uh at uh, uh um half past six uh, downstairs at the terrace of adriatico uh, guest house we have a reception so i mean it's something uh that economists uh, think is not possible it's a free lunch actually a free dinner so so you are all welcome to 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 join. Okay, thank you.